In the explanation of the first tracing board, it is stated that the usages and customs of Freemasonry correspond in a great degree with the mysteries of ancient Egypt. And there are some brethren who, in their belief in the antiquity of our order, would derive its origin from these mysteries. Good evening, and welcome to tonight's presentation from the Quarries, an archive of Masonic lore. It is generally believed that Egypt was the home of the mysteries, and I desire, as far as time will permit, to trace shortly how these Egyptian mysteries gradually found their way into and influenced the native religions of the nations with which Egypt came in contact. Probably no other nation of that time was better fitted by its mental structure, as revealed by what little we know of its literature and the comparatively advanced state of its knowledge to become the home of the mysteries. The amount of knowledge acquired by the priestly caste and revealed only to those chosen by them to share in that knowledge was very extensive and, for these times, very accurate. Living in a country where a yearly division of land was necessary, owing to the varying amounts of the Nile floods, a knowledge of geometry was gradually attained, which included not only the geometry of area, but also of solids and conic sections. Dr. Gao says, in reference to this subject, Beyond question, Egyptian geometry such as it was, was the germ from which grew that magnificent science to which every Englishman is indebted for his first lessons in right seeing and thinking. The scholars of the Nile Valley also possessed knowledge of the rudiments of trigonometry, and their approximation of the value of pi was not improved for many centuries. Ahmes a scribe of the Hyksos dynasty in 1900 BC, gave the value of pi as equal to 3.1605, a remarkably good approximation for the period when geometry was little more than mensuration. In matters arithmetical, they possessed a knowledge of the three progressions, arithmetical, geometrical, and harmonic. In astronomy, Without the help of accurate instruments of observation at the disposal of modern observers of the heavens, they had measured the obliquity of the ecliptic, had explained the solar and lunar eclipses, and, at a very early date, were in possession of the knowledge of the precession of the equinoxes. In arts and manufactures, they attained to a very high standard of excellence. As potters, they had few rivals, and they knew how to blow glass, they used saws, levers, and balances, and were skillful builders of ships. The gigantic and wonderful Hall of Karnak and the Pillars of Luxor, not to mention the Pyramids, testify that as masons they accomplished feats which could hardly be achieved in our mechanical and scientific age. And it is not too much to assert that the measurements that Greece handed on to Rome and Europe in the Middle Ages were derived from Egypt. Such were some of the ancient mysteries, and in general, candidates for these mysteries, and after purification by washing and a time spent in darkness, had to give his assent to the rules of the society, and an oath of fidelity was required of him, after which he was restored to light. A password was given to him and signs of recognition, and he was instructed in the names and attributes of their gods, and received instructions in the then known sciences. In some cases, the highest honour granted was participation in the election of a king. A belief in the immortality of the soul was, no doubt, communicated to those admitted to their mysteries. On the walls of the temples of Philae, 
were recorded the death, resurrection, and ascension and deification of the god to whom it was sacred. Not much is known of these mysteries, and what we do know of them is derived from the writings of the Greeks, and chiefly those of Iamblichus. But it may safely be said that they never, in Egypt, developed into centres of orgiastic licence, such as made a byword of the Bacchanalia at Rome and the Dionysiac ceremonies in Thrace. All this knowledge was the possession of the priest. Astronomers who selfishly acquired a predominant power by a policy of silence outside their order, even on these purely scientific matters. As regards their religion, Egypt suffered from a superfluity of gods and goddesses. It has been said that an enumeration of them would result in compilations resembling census returns. Herodotus tells us how a pharaoh of the 12th dynasty undertook to build the labyrinth as a temple to accommodate all the gods, and found it necessary to construct no fewer than 3,000 apartments. Here, as in the other great religions of the world, is found a trinity, in this case consisting of Osiris, Isis and Horus. Osiris, variously styled the Manifester of Good, Lord of Lords, King of the Gods, was the chief of the gods worshipped by the Egyptians, and represented the Nile and the Sun, on which Egypt entirely depended. After having conquered all Egypt and given it excellent laws, he was overcome by his evil brother, Set, who by a stratagem enclosed him in a chest and threw him into the sea. His wife Isis, having heard of this, set out in sorrow in search of the chest, which was driven ashore at Byblos and enclosed in a tree which had suddenly sprung up. Isis eventually obtained the chest and the body of Osiris, which his brother had divided into fourteen pieces. This was restored to life, and he afterwards became a judge of the dead. Isis was the chief goddess of Egyptian mythology, and, as I have just said, was the wife and sister of Osiris. Her worship was more particularly associated with Memphis, but at a later date it spread all over Egypt. The celebrations in connection with her mysteries lasted for eight days, and consisted of a general public purification by washing. Her priests were required to lead chaste lives and accept celibacy. The worship of the third member of the Trinity, Horus, the son of Osiris and Isis, was also general throughout Egypt. His eyes were represented by the sun and moon. His festival took place on the 30th of Epiphi. The images of Isis and Horus became, in early Christian days, those of the Virgin and the Child, and while one would not identify this trinity of deities with the Christian trinity, the underlying conception of a Divine Father, Mother and Son is perhaps akin to it. Among the Egyptians was developed a fairly clear idea of life after death, of punishment and reward, dependent on the life led previous to death. Pythagoras, a former pupil of the Egyptian priests, taught the immortality of the soul. According to Plutarch, the death of Osiris was celebrated annually throughout Egypt towards the end of November, when the Nile flood was subsiding. According to Herodotus, the grave of Osiris was at Sais in Lower Egypt, where there was a lake on which the sufferings of Osiris were displayed as a mystery by night. While the people mourned and beat their breasts to show their sorrow for the suffering of the god, an image of a cow made of gilt wood with a golden sun between its horns was carried out of the temple, where it had been placed at the termination of the previous year's commemoration. This probably represented Isis herself in her search for the dead body of Osiris. In the last days of the ceremonials, the priests, followed by the people, went down to the sea, the priests carrying a shrine containing a golden casket 
into which water was poured, accompanied with the shout that Osiris was found. A small, moon-shaped image was then formed and robed and ornamented, signifying the resurrection of the god. To show their joy, rows of oil lamps were fastened to the outside of the houses, and these burned throughout the night. The origin of Egyptian history is lost in the mists of antiquity. To fix its chronology is not easy. Sometime about the 3rd century before Christ, an Egyptian priest, Manetho, wrote a history of his native country, and divided the rulers of Egypt into 31 groups or dynasties. Historians generally have accepted this division, although there is not yet agreement on the chronology. It is generally agreed that Lower and Upper Egypt became united into one kingdom under a powerful and warlike chief who became the first pharaoh, and whose name was Menes, about 3500 BC. His capital was situated at Memphis. It is also known that during the 12th dynasty, Egypt, which had formerly been entirely agricultural, now became famous in commerce and came into touch with Europe, as a considerable amount of their trade was carried on with the island of Crete. Since 1894, archaeologists have been carrying on excavations on that island, and their discoveries have upset the previous knowledge of the historians, for they find that, at the time of their trading with the Egyptians, the inhabitants of that island were more advanced in their arts and sciences than were the Babylonians and the Egyptians. Here, however, is the first point of historical contact between Egypt and Europe, probably 2000 BC. But of more interest to us as Masons is the intercourse of Egyptians and the Jews. In the Bible, 200 references are made to Egypt, and 10 pharaohs are mentioned, although, unfortunately, their names are not mentioned. The first mention of a pharaoh is found in Genesis 12, verse 10, where Abraham, the founder of the Hebrew nation, had migrated from Babylonia into the land of Canaan, from which famine forced him to visit the fertile land of Egypt. This took place when Egypt was ruled over by the Hyksos, or Shepherd King, in the reign of the 17th dynasty. A little more than 200 years after that, during the 18th dynasty, that is, 100 years before the reign of Tut and Khamen, Jacob and his sons were driven by famine to Egypt to join Joseph, who had married Asenath, the daughter of the high priest of On, whose name was Potipharah, meaning the gift of the sun god, where was granted them some land lying between where now Cairo stands and where the Suez Canal has been constructed in the land of Goshen. This may truly be termed the cradle of the Jewish race. For when the time came for them to leave the land, their nation had increased from threescore and six to two million, encountering men, women, and children. Moses, the leader of the Exodus, under the name of Osasif, according to some authorities, is said to have held the office of high priest of On. No one of the Hebrews by training and education could have been better qualified to act as leader, and the laws laid down by him for a guidance in morals and hygiene have not been surpassed. These things became possible to him, no doubt through his training for the priesthood. The Exodus took place in the fifth year of the reign of Menephtah, 1486 BC. The next point of contact between a Hebrew leader and an Egyptian pharaoh is recorded in 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 1, when Solomon is stated to have married an Egyptian princess, a daughter of one of the pharaohs. Some authorities say that it was from this marriage and his dealings with his wife's nation that Solomon obtained his chief ideas of the plan of the temple at Jerusalem, dedicated about 1005 BC and destroyed in 588 BC, and that the two pillars which stood at the porchway or entrance of the temple 
erected by Solomon to keep ever before the eyes of the people a memorial of the happy deliverance of their forefathers from their Egyptian bondage, were merely copies of the obelisks which were to be found at the entrance of every Egyptian temple. The lions, too, which decorated the thrones of the Egyptian kings, had found a counterpart in the lions on each side of Solomon's throne, and the twelve on the steps leading thereto. Is it a mere coincidence that the two of our Grand Masters whom we associate, one with the opening of the First or Holy Lodge, the other with presiding at the opening of the Second or Sacred Lodge, should be so intimately connected with this mysterious land of the Pharaohs? As Masons, the latter relations between the Pharaohs and the Hebrews do not concern us. About 2,000 years after the journey of Abraham to Egypt, St. Paul makes a reference to the wealth of that people. At varying periods during that time, intercourse between the two nations was fairly close, and no doubt it had a considerable influence on the customs and beliefs of the Hebrews. To us, as Masons, the fact that many of our Masonic secrets are expressed in the Hebraic or Chaldaic language adds an additional interest to the study of the ancient history of these nations. After the expulsion of the Shepherd Kings, Egypt reached the zenith of her power. Her armies fought successful wars not only in Africa, but extended their victories to Asia and Europe, while her navy is said to have reached India. But her success was the cause of her undoing. Luxuriousness and indolence took hold of her peoples, and she had to submit to oppression under Ethiopia, until the priests elected to be king one of their own number, Sethos, who brought back peace to the land. On his death, the land was divided into several states. Over the province at the mouth of the Nile was a ruler, Semeticus by name, who engaged Greek mercenaries in his armies and was sympathetic to Greek emigrants and the Greek language, which resulted in Egypt becoming more and more under the sway of Greece. After a short period of Persian domination, Alexander the Great added Egypt to his immense dominion and founded Alexandria in 330 BC. This became the focus of Hellenistic, Egyptian and Eastern ideas. Here was established the famous library, which was burned down by the order of Caliph Omar in 642 AD. The Greeks ransacked the scientific literary and mystical treasures of the East and South. And with the accession of numerous Jews fleeing from the powers of Syria, Alexander developed a mystical Kabbalism that penetrated the whole Eastern Mediterranean and was known to St. Paul. What is more important than the employment of Greek mercenaries in the armies of Egypt is the fact that, in order to receive further learning, Egypt was visited by so many of Greece's greatest teachers and philosophers, either like Thales, who had no other teachers and was the first Greek to go to Egypt for instruction from the priests, or like Pythagoras, Democrates, Anaxagoras, Euxodus, Plato, Euclid, Archimedes, to add to their learning by becoming pupils of the priests. But gradually Rome became in the ascendant. In 200 BC, Egypt first entered the arena of Roman politics. Speaking of this period, Livy makes use of a particular expression when he says that he feels as though he were carried into a bottomless sea. Some see in this a reference to the fact that the sun entered the sign of Pisces a little before 200 BC. Moreover, this date, i.e. about 250 BC, civilization began to hide itself in symbolism and secret societies, and that is why some of the knowledge enshrined in the Greek Mysteria and the Roman Collegia passed into the Christian Church and the New Testament, so quietly, and is still so little recognised there. 
St. Paul says that he was a steward of the mysteries. About 30 BC, Augustus imposed Rome's imperium on the fertile province of Cleopatra. This knowledge acquired in Egypt became the common possession of the pupils who sat at the feet of these doctors of Egyptian philosophy. Facts show clearly a contact between Egypt and Greece lasting some 1500 years. In addition, Greek tradition fixes the foundation of Tyre and Sidon by Phoenix from Thebes in Egypt, the foundation of Athens by Kekrops from Sais in Egypt, of Thebes in central Greece by Cadmus from Egypt, Thebes and Argus by Danaeus from Libya about 1282 BC. Tradition refers the institution of the Greek mysteries to Orpheus or Dionysus, whose legendary date I believe to be 1600 BC. The chief of these, the Eleusinian mysteries in Attica, was said to have been imported by King Erechtheus, who in a time of scarcity, like Jacob's son, sought corn for his country in Egypt, and to have been instituted according to the writers Diodorus and Isocrates by order of Demeter, the great mother herself. Historically, it would seem that these mysteries were re-established, consequent upon the invasion of Greece, about 1000 years BC, by fierce Dorian tribes from the north. Greek and Phoenician colonies began to intermingle as early as 700 BC, perhaps earlier, and Greece's great struggle against Persia at Marathon, 490 BC, is evidence of much connection with the East via the Ionian Islands and Asia Minor. Certainly, from the 5th century BC, the Egyptian trinity of Isis, Osiris and Horus were represented in Greece by Demeter, Dionysius and Apollo respectively. It is not to be assumed that Greek initiates, though they took vows of secrecy, were as uncommunicative in their best period to the educated world as were the Egyptians. Such a babbling race, as gave democratic ideas to Europe, was well able to throw out hints before the dark hand of pagan Rome made secret societies dangerous, and, as a matter of fact, the Eleusinian schools were open to all free men, indiscriminately, and included the most distinguished statesmen and philosophers of the 5th and 4th centuries BC. Egypt is almost certainly the home of mysteries, but the Greeks imparted to their representations a measure of art and beauty. The public observances of the initiates consisted of sacrificial ceremonies, orgia, and purifications to avoid some calamity in this life, but private and personal purifications were enjoined against danger in a life to come. At Athens, violation of the mysteries was indictable under the jurisdiction of the archon or chief magistrate with a jury of initiates. The mysteries celebrated were those of Zeus in Crete, Hera in Argolis, Athena and Dionysus or Bacchus in Athens, Artemis or Diana in Arcadia, Hecate in Aegina and those of the Kabiri in Samothrace. But by far the most famous, and the only ones with which I shall deal, were those at Attica, in honour of Demeter and Persephone, mother and daughter. These were considered most holy and venerable throughout Greece, and laid hold on the popular imagination, as did no worship of the Olympians. The Homeric hymn to Demeter tells us that Demeter, sister and wife of Zeus, had a daughter Persephone, whom Hades, god of the unseen, carried off while she gathered flowers in the Nysian plains in Asia Minor. Demeter, mother of earth and goddess of the seed time and harvest, now cut off fruits from men until Zeus sent Mercury, his winged messenger, to Hades to recover Persephone on condition that she had eaten nothing in the kingdom of Hades. But Hades, 
that very morning had caused her to eat some grains of, of a pomegranate. Hence, she still spends one half of the year with Hades, and one half only in the upper air. Latin poets placed the seizure of Persephone in Ashfordel meadows of Sicilian Enna. This legend has a wonderful fascination, and if it can be said to enshrine any divine truth, it would be that of a divine mother and daughter, a feminine counterpart of the Christian father and son, the daughter also descending into hell until rescued by the son in the form of the word, or mercury. Now I think that all religions, anciently, were based on a prophecy of divine female revelation. To the ancients, a goddess mother was no difficulty. Demeter, Sibyl, Isis, Magna Mater, and the Virgin Mother are all akin, and only Protestants in cold latitudes would see anything strange in a Jerusalem mother of us all. However that may be, the worship of Demeter and Persephone was of Catholic acceptance in Greece, and by numerous testimonies was of a moralizing and uplifting nature. This is borne witness to by the Greek writers Pindar, Sophocles, Isocrates, Plutarch, and Plato. The mysteries were of two kinds, the lesser and the greater. Both kinds included spectacles as grand and impressive as painting, sculpture, music, and dancing could make them. The priests were called Kerakes or heralds. The lesser Eleusinia were held at Agre, on the Ulysses stream, in honour of the daughter Persephone alone. Only barbarians were excluded. The initiated were named Mystae, and they had to wait a year before admittance to the greater mysteries. The candidate took and washed a sow, then sacrificed it, symbolising that he purposed not to return like a sow to his wallowing in the mire. He was then sprinkled with water by a priest, and a hierophant administered an oath of secrecy. He was not admitted at once to Demeter's shrine, but remained during subsequent instruction in the porch or vestibule. Aristotle, however, asserts that no instruction was given to the mystae, but that while in a state of receptivity, a psychic state, their emotions and characters were acted upon. The rape of Persephone having taken place in the winter, the lesser mysteries were held in February. The greater mysteries were held annually for nine days in September, Athens being thronged with visitors from all parts. The first day was that of assembling. On the second, a solemn pomp or procession wended its way to the coast with the cry, Mystae to the sea, and purificatory rites were performed. The third day was a day of fasting. In the evening, a frugal meal was taken of sesame and honey, and sacrifices offered of fish and barley. Some maintain that there was nine days fast. On the fourth, a procession displayed the sacred things of Demeter, including pomegranates and poppy seeds in a basket. The fifth day became famous. The mystae, led by a torchbearer, went in, in the dark evening with torches, to the temple of Demeter at Eleusis to search, in imitation of her, for Persephone. Claudian gives a poetic picture of the shores and bay of Eleusis lit up by myriad lamps in the gloom. They remained all night. The sixth day was sacred to Iacchus, son of Demeter, and the Bacchus, or Dionysus, lord of earth. His statue was carried along the sacred road amid joyous shouts. 30,000 spectators was nothing uncommon. In the night of the 6th and 7th, the Mystae were initiated into the greater mysteries and became seers. Seers of future things, as St. Paul says, using the same word. In the lighted sanctuary, they were shown what none but Eptopi ever saw a dramatic representation to the accompaniment of ancient hymns of the death and resurrection of the Holy Child 
Iacus, and of the life of gods. These mystic sites are described as divinely ineffable. On the same night, they performed a sacrament with the words, I have fasted and I have drunk with the cookie on. I have taken from the chest. After tasting, I have deposited in the basket and from the basket into the chest. The words of dismissal were conks on packs. On the seventh day, they returned to Athens with happy jests, in imitations with which the sorrows of Demeter had been lightened. A mystical drama, says Clement of Alexandria, athletic games were held, the prize being a full corn in the ear. On the eighth were initiated those who were unable to be present on the sixth. The ninth was the day of full cups. Two cups were filled with water and or wine, and the contents were thrown, one to the east and one to the west. These Eleusinian mysteries long survived the independence of Greece. The general belief of the ancients was that they opened a comforting prospect of a future life. The most holy and perfect of the rites was to show an ear of corn mowed down in silence. One cannot but think of the text, except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and die. In my opinion, it is certain that the mysteries were, in a measure, preparatio evangelica, for, had I time, I could indicate very much mystery phraseology in the epistles and the book of Revelations. Gradually, the Egyptian gods, notwithstanding fierce persecution raged for a time against their worshippers, ousted the old religion of Rome, until its emperors were found filling their houses with the de-Egyptian gods and building temples to them in the public parts of Rome, while the soldiers of the Sixth Legion indulged in Isaac worship in York. And so it comes, as Dill in his Roman society says, the scenes which were so common at Rome, or Pompeii, or Corinth, the procession of shaven, white-robed priests and acolytes marching to the sound of chants and barbaric music, with the sacred images and symbols of a worship which had been cradled on the Nile ages before the time of Romulus, were reproduced in the remote villages on the edges of the Sahara and the Atlantic, in the valleys of the Alps, or in the Yorkshire Dales. For a deep dive into the history, philosophy, and traditions of Freemasonry, subscribe to From the Quarries. You will find hundreds of lectures, presentations, shorts, and other Masonic works written by Freemasons for Freemasons. Visit fromthequarries.com or YouTube at From the Quarries.